As an introduction, I'd like to start off with a few broad points to set the scene and to help you understand the subject uh, with the correct perspective in mind, inshallah. The first thing that we must understand that Islam is a complete way of life. Allah says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. Today I have completed and perfected for you your religion. Now perfection and completion is not only limited to ibadah, to our devotional worship, that is zakah, hajj, salah, saum, fasting. That is on its place. But perfection is not only limited to that. When Allah says we have perfected our religion for you, He meant the entire religion. And every sphere of a person's life is covered in the Sharia. So, if you look at the Sharia, it tackles every aspect of a person's life. It speaks about the aqidah, which is the belief system of a person. What to believe, what not to believe. It speaks about ibadah, which is our zakah, hajj, fasting, salah, prayer, and all other forms of ibadah. The sharia has also gone to a great length to address our financial transactions and our financial dealings, that is the monetary aspects of our life. The sharia has also addressed mu'ashara, that is our communal etiquettes, how to interact with people, on a general level. The Sharia has also taken into account the akhlaq of a person. So it's a wholesome picture. And it's a misunderstanding to think that the Sharia is only limited to the masjid as far as salah is concerned, as far as Quran tilawa is concerned, as far as dhikr is concerned. Uh, we, we should not limit the Sharia only to these tenets of deen. It's a complete picture. It's a complete kit that Allah has given the Muslim Ummah when he said, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. If you look at one of the classical books taught in the Hanafi Madhab, which is called Hidayah, it's in four volumes, spending over 2,000 pages, which is taught in every Darul Ulum, in every major Darul Ulum, only the first volume is dedicated to devotional worship. The balance three, over 1,500 pages dedicated to what? Penal law, marriage, divorce, inheritance, uh, business, trade, commerce. So as you can see, it even touches on politics. Because this ummah has passed through such phases where they were the leaders of the globe. If you study the Ottoman history, there is a leader amongst the Ottomans known as Suleiman al-Qanuni, who is known as Suleiman al-Qanuni, one of the best leaders of the Ottomans. If you look at his sophisticated penal law, from A to Z, even the Europeans have taken from his uh, way of ruling a country. So Islam, the point I'm emphasizing and impressing upon you is that our deen is complete. It covers every aspect of our life. A non-believer came to a Sahabi, and this narration is recorded in Muslim Sharif, the Sahabi Salman al-Farsi. And this man mockingly said, a non-believer, he said, لَقَدْ عَلَّمَكُمْ نَبِيُّكُمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَةِ You know, it's, it's rather strange that your Prophet teaches you everything. He even teaches you how to answer the call of nature. But he said this mockingly. He said this condescendingly. But this Sahabi, he replied with a lot of pride. And he said, Ajal, indeed, لَقَدْ نَهَانَا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَن نَسْتَقْبِلَ الْقِبْلَةَ بِغَائِطٍ أَوْ بِبَوْلٍ He said, indeed, you're right. Our Prophet has taught us everything. He even taught us how to relieve ourselves and answer the call of nature. You know what he said to us? He said, when you are in the bathroom, when you are answering the call of nature, do not face the Qibla. Subhanallah. And then he said, بالyameen, We should not use our right hand to wipe or clean ourselves. So this Sahabi felt a sense of pride. 
that you say mockingly to me that your prophet taught you everything, but I'm telling you with a sense of pride that yes, our Nabi has taught us everything, even the aspects pertaining to answering the call of nature. And that is why the details found in our religion is not found in any other religion. Subhanallah. Look at any chapter of a person's life, any chapter, you will find that there's no gray area. There's no gray area. And 1400 years down the line, the Quran and the Sunnah is still relevant and appealing to every aspect of our life. So my first introductory point is that Islam is a complete religion. It covers every aspect of our life. Intimacy is one aspect of our life, just as other aspects of life is important to the Sharia. The Sharia has taken into account our conjugal relations also. So it's part of the bigger picture. Understand that. The second point I want to start off with, the aspect of modesty. We often think that, you know, what about modesty, Manana? You can't talk about things like this. We must understand that the Prophet of Allah was explicit. By us being implicit, are we implying that we're more religious than the Prophet of Allah? The Prophet of Allah was open about these matters. In one hadith he said, Inna Allah la yastahi min al haq la ta'tu nisa'a fi adbarihinna. Allah does not shy away from mentioning the truth. Do not approach your women through the rear passage. Allahu Akbar. This is explicit content. He said, Allah does not shy away from mentioning the truth. Do not approach your women from the rear passage. So if the Prophet of Allah was explicit, by us being implicit, are we implying that the Prophet of Allah is not as religious as we are? Na'udhu Billah Min Dharik. So modesty is in its place. Every gathering has its decorum. Every gathering has its own persona. And every gathering lives up to a particular standard. Yes, there are ways of addressing issues. There is the aspect of decency. There is the matter of addressing it in a way where it does not offend anyone. But as far as addressing these issues, it's important. Mujahid Rahmatullah used to say, Two people will never benefit and will never acquire knowledge. Number one, a shy person. And number two, an arrogant person. A shy person is too scared to ask. You know, oh, you know, manana, I can't ask you this question, man. So he's scared. He'll live in oblivion. He'll live with the wrong understanding of the mas'ala, but he won't ask the question. So a shy person will not learn. And number two, an arrogant person will not learn because he can't belittle himself or humble himself and go to the next man and say, you know what, please help me or explain to me certain aspects of deen. So two things. One is shyness and one is arrogance. Yes, modesty has its place. Once the Prophet of Allah was sitting and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala was also there and a lady came to ask a personal question. She asked the Prophet of Allah a personal question. And the Prophet of Allah gave her the answer. After she left, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, continued with whatever he was doing. But Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, witnessing all this, she said, نِعْمَ النِّسَاءُ نِسَاءُ الْأَنصَارِ لَمْ يَكُنْ يَمْنَعُهُنَّ الْحَيَاءُ أَنْ يَتَفَقَّهْنَ فِي الدِّينَ She said, how praiseworthy are the people of Medina? And how praiseworthy are the women of Medina. Shyness does not stop them from gaining a deeper understanding about their religion. Subhanallah. It's a lady asking who? Not ordinary men. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa This is the kind of access they had to the Prophet of Allah. This is the kind of approachability the Prophet of Allah had. That anybody could ask them, Regarding anything, whether it's an uh, intimate question or it's a general question, they could approach the Prophet of Allah because he is the Sharia. And I need to bring my entire life according to his desires. Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you look at our ulama in the past, 
many scholars have addressed the issue of intimacy. If you look at Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi in his book, his famous book, Ihya'u Ulum al Din, he has a dedicated chapter on intimacy. Likewise, at tibb Nabawi by Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziyya, rahmatullahi he also has a dedicated chapter on this. Number three, you got Ishrat al Nisa by Imam Nisa'i, rahmatullahi So the ulama of the past and the ulama of the recent times continue to answer these questions. And they continue to provide guidelines on these matters, even though at times it becomes awkward. But you rather compromise the awkwardness and bring your life in alignment to the sunnah as opposed to living in the wrong version of uh, the mas'ala. That's the second point. The third point I want to explain here is that the need for Islamic guidance in sexual relations. We live in, in a highly sexual world. And we are bombarded on all fronts. You pick up your phone, you want to do simple browsing. Innocently, you're looking for something and you see an advertisement pop up. Or you see on groups. Wherever you go, you can't avoid this. It's an extremely active world. That's why our children are becoming balir and mature in this age, younger than what they were previously. Because of the access of the internet, because of internet dominating everyone's life here, the young, the old, the male, the female, the educated, the uneducated, everybody is influenced by social media, by mainstream media, and whatever we see and hear around us. Now, in an environment like this, it is so important for us to get the correct version of the Islamic perspective as opposed to going by the mainstream view, because at times it is highly problematic. Because they cross, they, they cross the borders of haya, of modesty. They cross the borders of permissibility in their intimate life. So the need is there. It's a genuine need. And many times a person wants to bring his conjugal relations and his internal affairs according to the sunnah. But he's shy. He can't, he doesn't have an avenue to learn. So this kind of platform is excellent, mashallah, to educate and equip ourselves as far as the teachings of Islam is concerned. You know, many times, people abstain from certain acts of intimacy thinking that it is haram. And certain times, people indulge in certain acts of intimacy thinking that it is halal, whereas it is haram. But the man will never query it. So the need is genuine. It is important for us to understand the environment that we are growing up in. And in the school environment, they've got proper curriculum to teach our youngsters about sexuality. You're not going to talk to your youngster about it, but he's going to learn. He's either going to learn the right version or the wrong version. Every child will go through this curriculum, whether you like it or not. Even Muslim schools are required to teach this. They work their own way around it, but it's part of the requirements from the government side. So you, they are already being educated in this regard. It's just a question, are they being educated and schooled in the right way according to the norms of the Sharia, or are they being educated in the wrong way? So people already have knowledge. And the fourth point that I'm going to mention, too, that people are going to fulfill their needs. It's either they're going to fulfill it the right way or the wrong way. But that's not going to stop them from fulfilling their needs. You ever heard a youngster, no, you know, Marana, I never studied this chapter, so I'm not going to do anything. You ever heard a youngster like that? He's going to fulfill his needs. He's either going to do it like an animal, or either he's going to follow the teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah. And the fifth point which I want to discuss this evening is Muslim. To acquire knowledge is compulsory upon every believer. Now the understanding of this hadith is that whichever phase of your life you are going through, at that moment, whichever laws of Sharia are incumbent upon you to learn, it is necessary for you to learn. For example, if a man doesn't have wealth, for him to learn about zakat is mustahab, it's recommended. 
But if a person has wealth and he has excess wealth, then to learn the rulings of zakah becomes fard for him. It is compulsory for him to learn then the rulings of zakah. If a person is not married, then to learn about marriage is mustahab. But if a person is married, now to learn about it is fard. So the rules of intimacy would be the same. If a man is not married, it's mustahab. He can learn about it. It's recommended. But if a person is married, then it is compulsory for him to learn what does the Sharia say as far as intimacy is concerned, both for the male and for the female. So it's important. We must have this understanding. So with these five broad points, once again, number one, Islam is a complete religion. It covers every aspect of our life. Halal, haram, trade, commerce, inheritance, marriage, divorce, penal law, everything. It also covers intimacy. Number two, modesty has to be understood in its proper context. Yes, there needs to be the decorum and the decency for every gathering. But that should not stop you from acquiring the proper understanding of the mas'ala. That's very important. Number three, I made mention to you, the need for Islamic guidance as far as sexual relations are concerned because of the situation that we find ourselves in. And number four, I made mention to you that the knowledge for each phase of your life is important according to what you're going through. I explained to you the mas'ala of zakah, I explained to you the mas'ala of hajj, I explained to you the other mas'ala. All these will tell us that at this moment in my life, whatever I'm going through, I need to understand what does the sharia say to me? What does the sharia say as far as this particular aspect of my life is concerned? Moving on further, what I want to discuss is that the first thing that we discuss is the intention behind everything that we do. And intimacy is no difference. Intimacy is no different. We perform salah, we have to have an intention. We give zakah, we have to have intention. If a person gives zakah with the intention of normal sadaqah, his zakah is not valid. You have to make the right intention. Likewise, if a person uh, is going for hajj, he needs to make an intention. A person is making wudu, he needs to make an intention. Intention is an integral part of our deen. And the sharia emphasizes that before you start anything, Rectify your intention, even when it comes to the matter of intimacy. So, what is the intention that a person should have? The primary intention that a person should keep in mind, is not that he should make this intention, but he should keep in mind is that I am fulfilling my need in a permissible way and I'm protecting myself from zina and haram. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when any of you go out and you are attracted by a woman, a beautiful woman, he said, you can fulfill your needs by returning home and fulfilling your needs with your wife. What is he telling us? That don't follow your temptations. Don't follow your desires and follow it up by haram. And this is what's happening in the corporate world. Allah protect us all. The Prophet of Allah said, you have a jais and a permissible outlet for you to fulfill your needs, and that is your wife or your husband. So the primary intention is that, oh Allah, I am fulfilling my needs through a halal avenue which you have provided, and you'll be rewarded for that. The Prophet of Allah was explaining this, and he said, وَفِي بُدْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً Having relations with your partner is an act of sadaqah. So the Sahaba were, you know, astonished. They said, oh, of Allah, how is that an act of worship? And how is that an act of sadaqah? The Prophet of Allah said, Tell me, O my Sahaba, if this very same action was done with somebody else in a different setup, wouldn't it be haram and zina? And wouldn't you be liable for a penalty? They said, Yes, O Nabi of Allah. Then he said, Why not in the right way? So the primary intention is to protect ourselves from zina and also to fulfill our needs in a permissible way. 
That is the intention a person should keep. There are other intentions that the ulama mention. For example, for procreation. فَإِنِّي مُكَافِرٌ بِكُمُ الْأُمَمَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ The Prophet of Allah said, I am going to increase. I want my ummah to increase their numbers because you will be representing my ummah and my nation on the day of Qiyamah. So for procreational purposes, it is also permissible to have that intention. But don't go into the bedroom thinking of the lady you saw today outside and thinking your wife that is dead. That is the wrong intention. That is haram. That is haram and that only you and Allah knows. What is in your heart is only Allah that is able to read. Your wife will never pick it up. But you can't go and become intimate with your partner, fantasizing of another lady or another man whilst you have a relation. That is the wrong intention. That is the wrong intention. It is haram to do so. We should not do so uh, in any circumstances. We'll stop at this point, And that is the intention part. In our next session, we'll go into the actual subject and we'll look at um, the fiqhi masail pertaining to the fiqh of intimacy, inshaAllah.